Welcome back. When last we left the saga of the claim for liens, we had notice number one at the beginning of your contract, if you're the, in your contract if you're the prime, within how many days if you're the sub of starting work? 60, A plus. Notice number two, given at the time you stop work, and for how many days out can you give that notice? 150, second A plus. Now, we get to a little bit tricky part. Notice number two must be given within 30 days before claim for lien. Notice number three. Just stick that in your head for a second and let's talk for claim, through claim for lien and I will tell you how that works. Okay, you have to have before thir at least 30 days before you file notice number three, you must file notice number two. You have to give the owner some notice before you encumber their title with a claim for lien. Okay, prime contractor claim for lien is the next form that's in your packet, followed by subcontractor claim for lien. Again, figure out which one you typically are, and you can follow along on that form. Now, if you went to Kim's seminar, and you've been keeping a project file, and on the timeline, you've been writing down critical dates like the day you started uh, excavation of the foundations and footings, the day you gave notice number two to the, contract, to the owner, and you kept all those, filling out the claim for lien will be a piece of cake. Because you will have assembled, including delivery tickets and all sorts of other things that you need to attach to the claim for lien, absolutely everything you need to preserve the claim for lien. And if not, you go back to asking yourself, when I started, was it raining? Was it snowing? and go pulling a building permit approval and looking for the information. Or if it's a big enough project. Now, some contractors ask me, am I going to do this on every single thing I do? The answer is probably not. There's some times where the job's small enough, the things pull and turn fast enough. You don't need to do this. Some people set a baseline. If it's over a certain price, I'm automatically going to do these lien notices. That's up to you. You have to set, and here's what I do. Here's what I, my husband had a construction company. And he said, well, how do I know when do I, what, where do I set that baseline? And, and the answer I gave was, if you can't afford to lose the money that you would have gotten if you don't get paid, you need to do your lien rates. So if it's a couple thousand bucks and you can absorb a couple thousand bucks, great. If you can't even absorb that, if you're not willing to absorb that and let an owner bilk you for even a thousand dollars, you're going to put your lien notices on every single project. Okay? Now, the claim for lien form starts out by reiterating all the information you provided before. It asks you for the name of the owner. It asks you for your name. It asks you how you sent out your first notice as a prime or a sub. It asks when and how you sent out your second notice, notice of intention to file claim for lien. It asks you how much you were owed, how much is your lienable claim, and it asks you to sign that document as an authorized agent and attach your first notices. When you do that, I want you to attach the delivery tickets that you use, the proof, the written confirmation of delivery, your e-mail, your receipt from the title company, or not from the title company, from the express mail company. Or if you really have a very nasty owner who's very savvy, we're talking about this during the break, if you really have somebody who's giving you a lot of grief, they reject registered mail, they, uh, they see a process server come and they run. Go to the county in which the land is situated, to the county sheriff's department, 
Every county in Wisconsin has a service of process division of the county sheriff, and for a flat fee, they will send somebody in a nice smoky outfit out to the house and serve. And they are very tenacious. They'll get somebody coming out the back door. And there's nothing more therapeutic sometimes, if an owner's really giving you grief, than sending the law enforcement to their front door and having a little chat with them as they sign their notice of intention or their claim for lien. Now, claim for lien form, what it really does is it's a checklist to make sure you properly preserved your lien claim. If you're not able to fill out these blanks because you didn't send a notice, you're finding out right then and there you don't have lien rights. Question? I guess I'm not sure when the right time to ask this question is, but um, do you find that most builders do this with their homeowners? I mean, that they file notice of intent and claim for lien? This whole process and everything? Like that? I, I, find, I find that the best builders automatically include it in their written contract and they attach it to the back side. They don't rely just on the MBA paragraph that's written there. They put two contract copies stapled to the back side. They talk to the homeowner and say, make sure you give a copy to your lender and your title company if you have one. And they don't do a notice of intent, notice number two, unless they don't have any other choice. They use that 150 days to negotiate as hard as they can and they winnow away. Even if all you're doing in that 150 days is trying to get through a few of the punch list items, I'll cough up $50 here for this item that you're unhappy about, and you resolve some of the small ticket issues, so you leave just one or two big clear things during that period. That's of advantage to you. And so you're only doing the notice of intent as a prime contractor and asking your subs to send that in on a timely basis where you don't have another remedy. You've tried everything else. And that's why the law gives you this big, long period to negotiate so that you try everything else because it really is a very serious remedy. And it's not without its cost for you to pursue. So you have to go into it with your eyes wide open. Even if you follow every single step correctly, and you file foreclosure, and we'll talk about the steps of foreclosure, and you get a judgment. If there's a mortgage lender ahead of you who has a super priority because of the type of loan that they've made, you won't necessarily see your money. So you have to go, it's, it's a tool in your tool belt. It's not the only tool. It's not a, what are those tools that have 62 gizmos off of it? It's not like that. Yeah, it's like, a, and it's not a Swiss knife, okay? It has a very specific application, and it can be used tactically, and maybe you don't go all the way with it. You use the notices to get the owner's attention and bring them back to the table when you still have some of your 150 days left. Maybe you do that. Or maybe you try, you're having good dialogue with the owner, and you say, okay, let's go sit down, at, uh, at the mom and pop restaurant and sit down and just talk this through. You get face to face with them. Why aren't you paying me? You ask that question. Why am I not getting paid? Because the answer will surprise you. Oh, I just feel so bad about that one change order I signed and I'm just not paying anything until it gets resolved. You're like, what? That was six months ago. Let's talk about the change order. Now, why do I say go to the mom and pop restaurant? Because there's a lot of people there. And even badly behaved people tend to behave well in little mom and pop restaurants. That's just my experience. Use it for what it's worth. Okay? If you have a really slimy, oily, nasty owner who's, who is abusing you, I would lean towards sending my lien notices in sooner and not giving them a lot of time because they'll divert funds, and you don't know where they're diverting them to. That's the only exception to wait and play it out. If what, if you're, and I use your gut. People come to me wanting to litigate a claim on a house. Their lien rights are gone, so they only have breach of contract left or unjust enrichment because they didn't get something in, in writing, and now they have an equitable claim potentially for a, a value added to the house. And they say to me, every single time they say, 
I had a bad feeling about this house when I started. Never ignore the bad feeling. Okay? And it's easy for me to say that. In a hard economy, it's easy for the lawyer to say, don't take the house where you felt at the beginning you had a bad problem. But you know you can't build for everybody. Not everybody was made to build with every single other person. There are some people that connect well. You know when you have good, solid communication with somebody. If you don't have that confidence at the front end, it's not going to get any better during the rest of the project. And you are doing yourself and your subs a favor by not turning yourself into a, you know, you might as well just get a hammer and start smacking yourself in the head because it'll be a little easier than the process you're going to go through if you don't take that advice. And I know that's hard, but trust your gut. Because every person that comes to me says, I should have I had a bad feeling about this. Okay? Don't ignore the bad feeling. All right, claim for lien. The forms are the same except the sub calls out for the 60-day notice, the prime for the notice that's in the written contract or delivered under the oral contract. It must be signed by the claimant, but it can be signed by an attorney or agent. So your attorney can file a claim for lien for you. A service can file a claim for lien for you. If you do that, and there's nothing wrong with it, just make sure you check the data for accuracy. Because if you inadvertently put a lien on something that is not proper, you can uh, have a claim brought back to you for slander of title. And if you fail to satisfy your lien where you have slander of title, the owner can get double damages, double the face amount of your claim for lien back. So you want to be a little careful. A claim for lien. Up till now, you've been mailing or delivering to the owner. Claim for lien, notice number three, goes to a different place. It goes to the clerk of court's office in the county where the land is situated. And you're going to bring with you three copies, a minimum of three copies of that claim for lien because there's a new requirement with the statutes. This is something that lenders and title companies lobbied for in 2006 when we made the rule changes because they were having a real problem. Claim for liens got filed and some clerk of courts took months to publish these lists and it really placed them in danger because they didn't know the claim for liens were out there. And the contractors were like, hey, if you don't my claim, know my claim for lien's not out there, how am I going to get paid? So there's a new requirement that says that um, the lien claimant has to give a copy of the file stamp claim for lien within 30 days after it's been filed. So you get an extra copy. And you, what you ask the clerk of courts for is a conformed copy. That's the magic words. If you just say a file stamp copy, they'll probably give it to you too. But you want a conformed copy. And that's what you, and, and all of the attachments, an exact duplicate. Because, and here's the other reason you get three copies. One, the clerk keeps. The second is for your files. The third goes to the owner of the land. Why do you keep that second one for yourself? Because in Wisconsin, human beings run the clerk of court's office. They can lose pieces of paper, even valuable ones like your claim for lien. It has happened that claim for liens were misfiled or lost, and where you have a file stamp copy, it'll have a stamp from the clerk of courts on the front page, then you can prove you timely filed your claim for lien. Okay, so I want you to keep that as a belt and suspenders. Now, best bargain in the world, filing claim for lien. Five bucks, five bucks, five bucks. Take five bucks down there. Um, some counties are very fussy, and they'll only take corporate checks instead of personal checks. If you don't know for sure what your county takes, call first. Call ahead and ask. Cash always works for them, but just be on the safe side. Because if you're coming in, on, day, uh, on, on the last day to file the claim for lien, and you all of a sudden don't have your five bucks, you blow your lien rights. Okay? Now, I want to go back to something. 
Okay. Claim for lien must be filed within six months of last work and at least 30 days after notice number two. What does that mean? What does that mean? What it means is there's this sliding window, a window of opportunity to file notice number two and notice number three. And we're going to practice right now to get it into your head. If I, on the last day, I work on the job, day number one after finishing the job, I send notice number two, notice of intention to file claim for lien. I can go out six months and file claim for lien, notice number three, and it's timely. That's the biggest gap you can possibly have. The skinniest gap you can possibly have is on the day I stop work, I file notice number three, or notice number two, notice of intention to file claim for lien, and 30 days later, I file claim for lien, notice number three. But I can't get those two, they can never touch. They kiss, you're dead. They gotta have 30 days between them. Now, you can have as much as six months and as little as 30 days. But now here's the tricky part. That 30 days can ratchet anywhere within the six months. It floats. So now let's practice, okay? We're gonna ask one of the lawyers who came today to help us with this because it's a hard question for the first one. Okay, Michael. All right, on day number one, the last day I worked on this project, I file notice number two. When's the first day I can file notice number three claim for lien? Day 30. 30 days later. And when's the last day I can file notice number three? Six months later. But now let's say, here's where it gets tricky. I file notice number two 60 days after I finish work. So now I'm 60 days out. How many days out is the soonest I can file claim for lien? 60 days out, you think? Yeah, if I'm 60 days out, 90. 90 days. Why? Why 90? 30 days between the two of them. Now in that same example, I'm 60 days out. When is the last day? I can file claim for lien. Six months, because you can never get past six months. You say six months from the end of your construction. If you're already out two months, then you need to do notice number two. You only have four months. Only four more months. That's right, because it's six months from the last work. Okay. Let's try another trick. Okay, go ahead. If you go to 150 days, though, then you're only leaving yourself like one day. That's right, and so you never want to do that, do you? You never want to wait until day 150 to file your claim for lien. Because what if you counted wrong? What if six months lands you on a Sunday or a holiday? Do you want to argue with the clerk of courts on the next Monday whether your lien was timely filed? Heck no. So when you do this, if you're going to do this, if you're the person in your office who's going to maintain the liens from now on, what you can do is get yourself one of these little flip calendars. And when you start a project and you put in that first notice, you make a note on your calendar. And on the day you end, you calculate out your deadlines. Or you use this form and you calculate out your deadlines and then you put them on your calendar. Last day to file notice number two on Herman Munster's house. Last day to file notice number three on Herman Munster's house. And then give yourself a tickler. You know how much time you need to pull out a piece of paper and get something filed or go to the courthouse. If you need two weeks, back up your train two weeks. If you need a month, back it up a month. Give yourself so that you turn the pages in that calendar and you've given yourself a month tickler that says, warning, notice number two coming up for Herman Munster house on such and such a date. You can give yourself two or three of those warnings if you wanted to. And every day you just turn that calendar and go, oh, got some lien notices to do today or soon. And then you protect yourself by not getting so tight. All right, who's up? Okay, go ahead. Say they 
moved in. You know, like whatever. And they, and they didn't file anything. They sec gave the second notice. Okay. And you still want that piece of work for two months on the road to fix something. You still get six months from the last time you were there. Okay. So the question is, you gave, you finished your work, and you gave notice number two right away. Let's say, okay. And then two months later, you come back and you're doing some warranty work or you're coming back and fixing some little thing. If they've been living in the house, you probably are not going to be getting a new six month clock running, nor do you need it because you filed notice number two, remember? Okay. <coughs> now let's say you didn't file notice number two when you first stopped work. And six, 60 days later, you're out there doing something. The test is, are you adding improvement to real property? Are you adding new value? Is it substantial work that you're doing? If you're coming out and you're making a warranty repair, that's probably not going to start your clock for you. Now, if that warranty repair is you take the furnace completely out and you put a new one in, well, you get a better argument for that than if I'm fixing the scratch on the underside of the inside of the cabinet because Lily Munster can't sleep at night with that scratch being there. You've never had clients like that, have you? <laughs> okay. All right. Let's take who's ready for a hard example. All right. Day number one. You finish. I know there's a couple gunners in here. I can see it. Um, you finish the construction of the project. And on day 45, you file notice number two. When's the soonest? How many days out can you file claim for the notice number three? 75. 75. How many said 75? Yay! Okay, day 45, you file notice number two. When's the last day you can file notice number three? Six months out. Can never be longer than six months out, right? Right? Six months out from the labor. What? Six months out from the labor being done. The last work being done. Yeah. Not from the 45 days. Okay? Don't take the count from the notice number two. You take it from last work. Less work or is uh, substantial work? Substantial, substantial completion. Substantial when you can use the property for the purpose for which it was intended. Now, a contractor will come to me and he'll say, I didn't send out notice number two on time. And, but I did go back and I did some warranty work. And uh, it was pretty substantial. Will I guts it and file a notice number two and try and get some action going from a notice of intention? You bet. Absolutely. Because a mere notice of intent does not encumber real property title. A claim for lien does, though. And so you don't file notice number three, claim for lien, unless you really are sure you got the horses in the barn and that you've timely put your three notices in. Because otherwise, an owner and a title company can bring a slander of title action and force you to remove your lien, leaving you with just contract remedies. And if the owner's not paying you a getting a contract remedy is not terribly useful. You know, if the owner's not paying you because the loan is gone, or they took the money and they ran off with it, or whatever the story is, having lien rights at your disposal gets some attention, gets you the potential to be paid. All right. Your second, your second notice has to be within 120 days. 150 days. If you have a hundred and uh, six months is 180 days. So back up 30 days from that. And notice number two, last day for notice number two, again, is 150 days from the last work, last the substantial completion work on the project. Okay? We talked about filing with the owner. You're attaching all your previous copies of your notice number one and notice number two, along with the delivery tickets. You're making a claim for, and you're signing it. And now, you've taken that to the clerk of courts. 
you've given a copy to the owner within 30 days, that claim for lien will last for two years. It can sit there for two long years. But after two years from the date it's filed, it disappears like it never happened. So within two years, you have to make a business decision to foreclose on that lien, to take the next step, which involves court action, to preserve a lien. Before we go on to that section, I want to ask if there are any other questions about claim for lien filing. Anything other <coughs> strategies, tactics? Sure. Waiver of construction lien. I swear I didn't pay her to ask that question. <laughs> Let's talk about waivers of construction lien, okay? Very logical next step in the process. A construction waiver in Wisconsin is valid. It is valid whether or not money is paid for the work. You don't have to get paid to give up your lien rights. You don't have to get paid to give up your lien rights. You can give up your lien rights right now for your whole project. It's valid if you sign it before or after you furnish your services. You don't even have to do a stick of work on the job and you can give up your lien rights. That's why the guy who sat at the football game and signed the whole set of legal blanks and turned the forms over to his general had no lien rights. No lien rights. He may have a claim against the sub that didn't pay him, but he's not going to bother you, the prime, or your owner. Right. Too bad, so sad. Yeah. Too bad, so sad. Now that's why title companies and lenders want your waivers and why there's this, this dance going on with, I want my money in exchange for the waiver. And I wish that the lien law gave you a fabulous way of handling that. But it gives you, it's the single most frustrating aspect of the lien law. And there's not a good solution. And that's why, <coughs> excuse me, I think that's why you have seen in situations where the owner's concerned about the prime not paying, where title companies are suggesting things like direct paying to subcontractors where the general approves the dispersal to subs, and the sub comes and trades a waiver for a check, waiver for a check, waiver for a check. Because it's trying to protect you. Because once you give this piece of paper, if you don't get paid, you have a problem. Now, sometimes people say, well, sometimes I gave up my waivers because I had an owner authorization for payment, and then they canceled the draw. If that ever happens to you, this is where spending a little time and getting to know your title company and being really straight and nice with them pays off big dividends. You call up the title company and say, the owner just canceled my draw request. Give me my waivers back. Let me protect myself and my subs. And a good title company will typically do that for you because they don't want to be holding stuff that is, is a, a problem for both parties. Sometimes you get a check and it bounces and you've given up your lien rights. Yes, your lien rights are gone, but they were obtained by fraudulent means. So you have a claim for conversion, and you have a criminal claim that you can bring against that party that bounced a check. And you go to the district attorney or the city attorney, and you ask to file charges. Question back here. The title company does not have to accept any waiver they don't want to. They set their own limits for what is an appropriate waiver. And most title companies are uncomfortable with conditional waivers because it just means that after the condition is satisfied, they've got to get a final waiver. 
And so it is possible, because ambiguity is construed against the drafter, you have to be very clear if you're going to make an exception, like contingent upon payment, or only for rough window installation, whatever it is, that you're very clear about what it is, and then you expressly accept what's limited. If there's an exception, you've preserved your lien rights for the exception. Everything else is waived. So if you sign a waiver that says anything having to do with 123 Mockingbird Lane, even if you came back two years later and worked on it, you don't have lien rights anymore. It's very broad and it's construed against you preparing the lien waiver. Now, here's where, this is the part the title company is not so happy for you to know, but it's the truth. You are entitled to refuse to sign a lien waiver unless you are paid. And so this ends up being a dance. If you're the general contractor, you want to collect the labors, waivers so you can turn them in and get the payment and pay your subs. And a good trade contractor, all day and all night, that happens. All the time it's happening. Waivers are collected, title company is happy, disbursement gets made, title gets cleared, and the sub ends up with money. Even a good contractor can have bad stuff happen to them. Have an owner cancel a payment, you know, withdraw a payment after they've approved it, cancel a check, stop payment. There are things that can happen. The very best thing that I can tell you is if there's a problem after you've collected a waiver, stay in communication with your subs. Stay in communication so that they know what's going on. If they ask to have this, the waiver returned, I'd give it to them because you're not in a position to compel it. They have a right to withhold it. Now they also have a right, it's not legal to have somebody waive their lien rights by contract. So a savvy owner on that multi-million dollar shack you're building can't say to you at the front end of the contract, waive your lien rights as a prime contractor. Even if you're bonding the subs, they can't force you to give up your lien rights by a contract at the front end. That's illegal in Wisconsin. But if you choose to give up a waiver at any other time, whether you've been paid, whether you've even done the work, you are giving up lien rights and it'll be construed against you if it's ambiguous. So if there's a way to read it broadly, a court's going to read it broadly against your interests to preserve your lien rights. It does not waive, a lien waiver does not waive contract rights between a sub and a prime. So just because you get a lien waiver doesn't mean the sub can't come back to you and ask for an extra and assert breach of contract against you or unjust enrichment. But it keeps them from filing a lien claim against your owner's property. If you accept a promissory note, a promise to pay, a business note, it will not waive your lien rights unless it says so right on the face of the note. So sometimes a contractor says, listen, I had a bad problem on this job. We lost a lot of money. Owner's not paying me. Will you take a promissory note? I'll make payments, $500 a month until it's paid. You're not giving up your lien rights unless there's also a lien waiver in that promissory note that gets signed. Okay? Here's the difference between a waiver and a satisfaction of claim for lien. Now, this is another form that's in your packet. There's both full and partial satisfactions of claim for lien. Hang in there. You're coming almost to the end of the forms. You're doing great. If notice number three has been filed, you use a satisfaction of lien. Any time up till then, you, lose, you use a waiver. Now, sometimes you get the claim for lien filed, and you have a title company way up north to here, that isn't as sophisticated as some of them down here, who will say they want both a waiver and a satisfaction. You know, because Kim just told you, you only need the satisfaction. But if it gets you paid, give them the other piece of paper. No harm, no foul. Just give it to them. If it makes them happy, happy to have a belt and suspenders, and post-its and paper clips to keep their pants up, fine. No, no worries, just give me my check. But trade it, trade the check 
for the satisfaction. Now, if you get paid, Glorioski, you got paid after your claim for lien is filed, so you're going to be using what form? Satisfaction. And you fail to give it to the owner, the owner's got a claim against you that they can make for one half the face amount of your claim for lien that you're not releasing. So even though you're really ticked off at this owner who made you go through living hell, once you get paid, you've got to satisfy. You've got to tender it to the owner or the owner's agent. That could be an attorney, a lender, a title company asking for the satisfaction. Don't jerk them around with it because all it does is create misery for you. Questions about waiver and satisfaction? Yes, ma'am. The statutes are not entirely clear. Here's the practice that I follow, okay? If the owner is demanding that I file it and pay the five bucks, I do it. Rather than run the risk that my client has exposure for one half of the face amount to the claim for lien. But I think the fairer, better reading of the statutes as they're currently written is if you tender it to the owner or the owner's agent that asks you for it, your obligation is done, and they have to pay the five bucks and go to the courthouse and file it. Yes, ma'am. And just for my own benefit, I know when you work with title companies, in a case like this, sometimes you're better to give it directly to the title company so at least it's well moving forward. Yeah, I've, I've issued full or partial satisfactions to multiple people, you know, duplicate copies of them. Like, I'll find out, I'll say, okay, who wants it? Title company, great. I make sure a copy of a letter that says, title company, here's the original, copy enclosed to owner, copy enclosed to lender, copy enclosed to these subcontractors. Now the difference between the full and partial lien waiver form is if you get paid in full or not. The partial will reserve your lien claim for the amount you haven't been paid. And just follow the fill-in of the blanks of that to preserve the remainder of your lien. So if the owner pays you 30 grand but he owes you 150, you just reserve the remaining 120 and your lien still stays properly reserved. You don't have to go back to notice number one and number two again. You just make a partial release of that lien. Now, if a claim for lien is filed, you're a prime contractor and your sub says, I'm owed money and you go, no you're not. You screwed up and I had to back charge you and it was legitimate. Don't you dare file a claim for lien and they do it anyhow. And the owner goes, hey, I have a claim for lien on my property. What the statute says is you, prime contractor, have a duty to defend, to remove that lien from the owner. And if the owner tenders that lien claim to you, one of the things that you can do is an undertaking. You can remove the lien completely from record by depositing 150% of the face amount of the claim for lien in cash or getting a surety bond equal to 125% of the face amount of the claim for lien or other sufficient security. And there's a process of filing a motion in court, giving a time for the lien claimant to object, and then that surety bond or cash or other security substitutes for the claim for lien and the owner's out of it. And so tactically, you might take the wind out of your sub sales and say, you and I have a private arbitration coming up. You get your lien off my client's property. I'm not going to play this game of lien foreclosure with you. I want you and me to sit down and work this out. In the meantime, I'll post bond. Sureties will, simple, uh, will typically take a fixed fee that's non-refundable. Sometimes banks will do a letter of credit, again, for a fixed fee. Um, some people will post, I personally guarantee. And if the party, the lien claimant, doesn't object, the court says, fine, no objection. Your personal guarantee substitutes for the lien. So it's a sufficient surety in the judge's opinion that will allow for the substitution. So you can get really creative there sometimes, depending on the sophistication level of the lien claimant. Um, you have to serve notice that you're
filing an undertaking with the lien claimant and give them time, a uh, 30-day window, to object. If there's an action brought, like a foreclosure action, after your undertaking is posted, you go through all the steps. They still have to show they properly filed their notices in the right time sequence. Only the remedy is not lien foreclosure. The remedy is to latch onto that bond or cash or letter of credit if you fail to pay the judgment. Lien foreclosure. Before we go diving off into the lien foreclosure process, are there any questions about the forms we talked about today? Sure. Okay. How do we deal with that? I mean, you're saying if we give them a signed lien, rate, lien waiver, we're giving that up. It is a dance. It is, a, it is risky. You know, the title company and the owner and the lender are going to want those waivers at the time they issue the check to the prime. Mm -hmm. But that leaves you potentially unpaid. And again, use your best judgment. Use that warning Will Robinson feeling in the back of your head. If it feels wrong, Offer, listen, I'll go, allow the title company to cut me my check direct. You've been really late on these other two, and I can't afford to have you not pay me on this one. I'll go to the title company direct and swap out my waiver for a check. If, but you've got to authorize it with the title company. Most title companies, if you're the prime contractor and you ask for that, the owner's not forcing it, you ask for that, for a flat fee per check, they'll do that for you because it helps them preserve their lien rights and so they're willing to help with that process. That's one option. Another option would be to say, um, I want a certain amount of money advanced. You know, make your contract have different payment stream in it so you're never out so far. You know, divvy up your, your uh, purchase of equipment into two blocks instead of one big one. You know, make the amounts be smaller, less risky for you. But there is no good answer for that. That's the reality of the system, yeah. So on the topic of prime paying slow or even funds for other projects, is there a time frame to when they get the funds for the title company that they're forced to disperse it? On a residential project, there is no time frame by which you must pay. It is driven by Two things, if you have a written contract and the contract says you must pay within a certain number of days, then you have a contractual obligation to pay within a certain number of days. If the contract is silent as to the number of days for payment, the law implies, a common law in Wisconsin, a reasonable time. Now what's a reasonable time? Totally dependent on the context. Totally dependent on circumstances. In my experience, if there's nothing wrong with that sub's work, most courts are feeling antsy after 90 to 120 days, unless there's some other extenuating circumstance relating to that sub that they're involved in, not just so they, you know, they're caught up in the process of, every, of some other sub being screwed up. But that's the, that's the rule. It's this amorphous reasonableness test. Yes, sir. I'm a GC. I'm nervous about paying one of my subs. Okay. Maybe he gets a supplier. supplier. Okay. How do you feel about a two-party check? Um, <coughs> if your contract with your sub allows for a two-party check to be issued in partial satisfaction of the amount you owe the subcontractor. So you're writing a two-party check to the sub and the supplier for the HVAC equipment, let's say. Okay, If your contract says you can do that, great. The gates of heaven swing open. If you have a letter signed by the sub that says you can do that, great. The gates of heaven swing open. I wouldn't want to do that just orally, though, because that check could be construed by the subcontractor as non-payment. And so you might end up having to pay twice if you don't have it in writing that that satisfies your contract obligation to the sub. I think emails work dandy um, in documenting that there was an offer, acceptance, and consideration.
but it's not signed by the parties to be bound. And so some courts are a little more iffish about that. Again, if you're going to do e-commerce, you've got to follow the e-commerce rules. And so you'd have to have, um, now, there's no e-commerce for commercial transactions, like between you and your sub. So I would want something that says, if you sign and send the, or if you email this back to me accepting, then I will treat that as though you had signed and sent this back to me. The other thing you can do if you're ever worried about, is email going to be good enough? Say, a facsimile signature shall be as binding as an original. Have a fax and sign a fax and send it back to you. That's another way that would work, I think. Yeah? Just send a check to the supplier and then the, and the, you know, and the other subcontractor just for his part. So, so one option is... Say how much are the candles and right, and so... Bucks, send them a thousand bucks, send him the, the remainder. Okay, so the question is, subcontractors owed four grand. And a thousand of it is for the shingles, the supplier. Can you send a thousand to the supplier and three thousand to the subcontractor? If you don't have that written agreement that I talked about, either in your contract or in a separate writing that shows that the sub agreed to that, they can come back to you for the other thousand, even though they owed it to the supplier. That's the risk you run. Question. So you can ask for more waivers than you are required to furnish. That's true. But if your sub's a smooth talker, and that's what got them into trouble in the first place, they can get the waiver and still not pay the sub. And you've gotten rid of the lien claim from that supplier. But are they still going to be happy with you? And are they a supplier you ever go to? And do you ever want to work with them again? I mean, there are tactical reasons why that might not be enough. It might be, but it might not be. Being a good neighbor goes around in this business mighty quick. Yeah? Well, the question on, that Gary brought up, like a two-party check for the sub and the supplier. And the supply bill on there was $1,000 for shingles, but the roofer owes the supplier $3,000 to pull along the check. Okay, so the supplier wants more money than your two-party check is the issue. If you have in writing and you've paid out your full 4000 to the sub, either through two-party check or direct check or a combination, and the supplier doesn't cash the two-party check, but you have an agreement from the sub that that is sufficient payment to them, that's consideration. You don't owe that sub anything, and you don't know, owe the supplier anything. Bless you. Yeah, my question is, maybe I didn't say this quite right, the bill for that particular job is 1000 Subcontractor owes the supplier more than 1000 Oh. Yeah. Okay, so the sub, let's take the best case scenario. The sub made a mistake on their price, and they're running short on how much they have available to pay the sub. <coughs> That's the worst example. I'll get there in a second. Okay, let's take the best example. They just made a bad bid, and they're running short of what they owe the supplier. Okay. That's not illegal. That's just a mistake. And that sub can lien your project. And you've got to figure out how you're going to deal with that lien and that sub. If, however, the sub had $4,000 that you gave them and was supposed to pay $3,000 to the supplier and only paid two and took the other two and went to the Tahiti for a vacation or paid off another project, or paid off another supplier, that is theft by contractor, whether your sub does it or you do it. And there are both civil and criminal remedies available to address that action. You must segregate funds from a project draw and pay them out proportionately in the case of shortfall to the people to which that payment applies. 
Now there's a very interesting case that just came down a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, that said in this particular case, the draw wasn't enough, the amount that the owner paid wasn't enough to pay the full draw. And the prime contractor scooped up a bunch of money and said, I'm going to take and pay 100% of my general contracting fee. And I'm going to pay, um, I did some interior design, I self-performed some of the work. I'm going to pay that 100% in full and leave my sub sitting. Court said, no way, nice try, French fry. That's theft by contractor. You can't do that. You have to figure out, if you've got 70% of the total draw, you sprinkle 70% over all the line items. That's what the court said. Now, how the court said that was a little bit ambiguous. So if you ever get in that bad situation, I want you to check what the law is, because this is going to be an area where I expect the law to change rapidly in the next few years. If you get stuck in that bad situation where you've got a shortfall, be very, very careful, because you could inadvertently commit theft by contractor by not by, because some people might interpret that case as saying you don't get any of your general contracting fee or you don't get any of your net profit, that 70% of your net profit, you've got to pay your subs out proportionally the rest. It's ambiguous how that case is to be interpreted. Okay? Very tough question. Very tough question. Yes, sir? You, you um, spoke uh, earlier about the third or fourth tier. Uh, the third or fourth tier sub. Yep. Yep. How does the prime protect themselves from third and fourth tier subs and suppliers? You know that the HVAC contractor doesn't keep a furnace in his basement most times. You know which of the subs are likely to have big supply tickets. And if you're a good prime contractor on general construction and residence, you're not just only seeing your sub on the job site the day you need him to show up for work and you never see him again until he asks for a check. You're keeping in contact with your sub. You're going having a cup of coffee with your sub, finding out how they're doing. Are things running lean? I'll be trying to pay you real prompt, but I'm going to need waivers from your suppliers. Oh, you know, why don't we on this one, I know you're running tight, let's enter into a joint check arrangement or a direct pay arrangement on this project. So I, so I know and feel comfortable that the supplier's getting paid. I mean, you can kind of tell where the big ticket supplies are going to be. And you can in your subcontract say, you can't sub-subcontract unless you tell me. And then you watch on the job. Is Mickey the Dunce showing up to swing a hammer? Where'd you come from? I hired Joe the Ace. I hired, I hired Mary the Superb Builder. How'd you get out here, Mickey? You know, you watch to see if they're trying to sub, sub out. And you, you, your expediter has a front end obligation to watch that a little bit. There's not good answers for that one either. You have to just watch that warning system that keeps you up at night as a general contractor, right? Okay? Lead foreclosure. What is this whole beast about? How does it work? I'm going to go very just a very thumbnail sketch of this, okay? Because I want you to be informed about what it means. Just because you have a claim for lien doesn't automatically get you paid. That's the one more important thing I want you to understand. If you want to foreclose, it starts with a summons and complaint that's served on the owner of the real property and anybody who holds a lien interest. So any other lien claimants, mortgage holders, if there's a tax or other judgment assessed against the property, you name all those parties. An answer gets filed within 20 days on a, a, by the homeowner saying, yes, I owe the money, or no, I don't. They say, yes, you move for summary judgment, and you take a judgment against them, and you sell their house. If they say, no, there is a preliminary hearing, and typically what's called a pretrial conference. At the pretrial conference, the judge will set a schedule for discovery the exchange of requests for information, either in writing or through depositions or testimony, live testimony. How many of you have ever had a deposition taken? Not the funnest thing you've ever gone through, is it? They're, a, they're not very fun. 
Um, some lawyer is going to ask you, you know, what color were your socks on the first day you went out on the job site? And you'll be like, oh, geez, was it? I think it was blue. I think it was blue. It's a lot of work going through these cases. There's time and energy, your energy and your attention diverted. While you're in this deposition, you're not in the field building the, the new house. You're in, the, you're in a deposition sitting there, listen to a lawyer ask you a bunch of whiny questions for three days. And you have to keep your temper and not swear or spit the whole time. If you are lucky and the facts are not disputed, if the facts are plain, you had a contract, and this is where having a written contract is awful, awful nice, signed by the party to be bound. Because remember, a contract is offer plus acceptance plus consideration. consideration. And it can be oral, but if it's in writing, signed by the owner, there's a change order. Owner signs the change order, doesn't dispute in the answer that he owes for it. You can move for summary judgment and say, the law is clear. I'm entitled to payment. I have a written contract. They don't dispute. They owe the money. Pay me. And the judge will say, the gates of heaven swing open, young, young person. You get your judgment. If the facts are disputed, and I guarantee you, in that 150 days that you waffled back and forth about whether you should file notice number two, and you're negotiating and talking with your subs and the owner and the lender and the title company and anybody else who will listen, if you forgot to ask, is there some problem with my work, you will now find out with a vengeance. <laughs> Every little stupid thing that could be wrong with your work, you will hear about. And it is galling to hear the kind of complaints when you slaved over somebody's house. You have to be prepared for that mentally, emotionally, and not let it get to you. You have to wear your dragon armor into litigation, my friends. Don't go in unprotected. Don't go in thinking it's this fast, simple, easy, cost-effective thing. You go in to litigation when you have no other choice. And just the same way, like, would you just open up a phone book and find the name of a subcontractor and just say, come on down and work on my house. Come swing a hammer. Would you do that? I hope not. You would never do that. That's not how you pick out a good subcontractor. Same way, that's not how you pick out a good lawyer. Okay? Lawyers are human beings too. And lawyers have different levels of experience. If you're building a $5 million house, you don't let Mickey the Dunce swing the hammer on it. Right? You get a really high-end finishing contractor out there. Same way you have a multi-million dollar lien claim, you find a lawyer who does construction law, who knows who's gone through foreclosure. And how do you know that? You ask around the MBA, you ask around amongst your friends and neighbors, and then you ask the lawyer when you interview the lawyer. Ask a good lawyer will let you interview them over the phone or in person not charge you. What do you know about it? Have you ever gone through lien foreclosure? Have you taken all the way to sheriff sale? What kind of problems have you run into? Do you typically negotiate on the client? On the, uh, have you gone to arbitration? Have you gone to the MBA's arbitration process? Those are the kind of questions you want to be asking the person that's going to represent you in court. Because unless you are an individual, your company or corporation or LLC must have legal counsel to file this action and to take you to trial. Trial can be to a judge or it can be to a 6 or 12 person jury. You control that and there are pros and cons to that your lawyer can talk you through depending on the nature of the case. Sometimes it's really good to have a jury because they see the owner being picky you and about stupid stuff and they go, oh, I know what happened. They're just trying to rip this contractor off. Other times that backfires and they're like, oh, that mean contractor wanted the owner to pay because they wanted to add a board over here. Well, it's a structural beam. And they don't know from beams. They don't know from structural engineering. 
So it depends. Tactically, you might be better off having a judge who might be a little more sophisticated deal with your, your change order about a structural beam or a critical path delay than a jury. Once you get a verdict in your favor, either by summary judgment or by trial, the judgment, the order is rendered, entered, and docketed. That means the judge signs a piece of paper saying you win. It's entered in the clerk of court's office, and it's docketed there. Once you have that, you can start your sheriff's sale. That's a whole nother set of motions for the sheriff's sale, because you're not done yet. The sheriff sells the, sa the property after you've put about $300 worth of notices in trade papers. And you can take your lien amount and bid that like it was cash at the sheriff's sale. But if there's a mortgage or another lien ahead of you, they can do the same thing. So tactically, you might not even ever go through foreclosure, lien foreclosure, because somebody's ahead of you, the bank's ahead of you, and you don't have a million dollars to spend to get your money back. So you have to use this remedy very carefully, very cautiously, looking at what your rights are. If you, at the time you start the action, that's another time I'll get a letter report, or a title commitment even, from a title company, to find out who's ahead of you in time and right ahead of your lien claim. The sale, the sale gets confirmed in circuit court and you get money unless there's an appeal. There's a two-step appeal process, a court of appeals and a Supreme Court. Everybody has an appeal of right to the court of appeals. You have to have permission to go to the Supreme Court. It can take years. Don't go into this with your eyes closed. Go with your eyes wide open. You're only doing this where you have no other choice. But now that you know the steps, you can act in an informed way. Sometimes you start a piece of litigation knowing tactically you're going to move to mediation and try and settle it. Move to MBA arbitration to get a, an award of dollars and then just foreclose in circuit court. All kinds of options are available, but you have to ask and get yourself informed. And don't stop asking questions of your attorney. A good attorney's not going to be upset by that any more than you're upset by a homeowner that asks a lot of questions about specs at the front end of a project. Same thing. I will take questions after the session is over, but we need to end the session right now. Thank you very much. You've been an excellent audience. Really good questions today. Take care. <laughs>